Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's video. On today's video, we're in part three of our new series entitled Permanent Impairment Home Runs and Strikeouts. And in our first session of this series, we talked about how now, unlike any time prior in California history, qualified medical evaluators have a new omnipotence, a new power to provide for permanent impairment ratings much, much, much higher than the permanent impairment ratings that are provided for by the strict application of the AMA guides. But the Almarez and Guzman line of cases admonish us as qualified medical evaluators that we're not allowed to go on a fishing expedition through the guides and we're not allowed to manipulate the guides simply to achieve what they referred to in the Almarez and Guzman line of cases as a better result, a better result. Well, as we all know, the purpose of providing for alternative impairment ratings under Almarez and Guzman is to provide a higher permanent impairment rating. I've never, ever, ever single uh, s seen once, one single instance where an Almarez and Guzman alternative impairment rating has been provided by a qualified medical evaluator that had the purpose of lowering the permanent impairment rating. So under Almarez and Guzman, all alternative impairment ratings have the effect of increasing the permanent impairment rating, which is provided for under the strict application of the AMA guides. So if that's true, you can bet <laughs> <laughs> you can bet that your alternative impairment rating is going to receive close scrutiny from the payer of benefits, that is the claims administrator and by proxy, uh, the defense attorney. So in order for your alternative permanent impairment opinion under Almarez and Guzman to gain any traction and to have any hope of being upheld by the workers comp judge, the opinion must qualify as substantial medical evidence. And you must have some compelling reason as to why the alternative impairment rating is more accurate than the strict rating. And you can simply not rely on the fact that you're trying to produce a better result <laughs> for the examinee. And we saw in our last session, one qualified medical evaluator had many, many, many non-medical reasons, in other words, they were all administrative reasons, for trying to provide the examinee with a higher permanent impairment rating. And just to reiterate, that qualified medical evaluator was explaining how the examinee had been displaced from her job and how she had no job to go back to. And for that reason, uh, he felt that she qualified for a higher permanent impairment rating and he tried to comport and contort his explanation as to why the alternative impairment rating was more accurate than the strict rating. And the judge simply did not buy it because it was clear to all parties and the doctor even said it in his testimony that he was simply trying to achieve a better result. I spoke to another doctor uh, on the phone the other day and he also was trying to uh, employ Elmeriz and Guzman alternative ratings to his examinee and I asked him, well, why, why do you want to use an alternative impairment rating? And he stated to me that in his opinion, he felt that this examinee had been jacked around and jerked around throughout the life of her claim. And because she had been jerked around, he felt <laughs> that it was his job to try and make things better for her, make things right for her by providing a higher impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman. And I told him, no, do not do it. Do not do it. You leave medical matters. You handle the medical matters. Let administrative matters fall under the administrative parties. Your job is to focus on an accurate permanent impairment rating. And if the strict rating provides an accurate ratings, just stick with it. Let the administrative matters sort themselves out. Now, in today's discussion, I want to talk to you uh, about uh, a new form of alternative impairment ratings. Uh, 
by analogy to gate disturbance. Now, in our last session, we talked about the direct estimate method of rating permanent impairment. And like the direct estimate method that we talked about last time, analogies to gate derangement and gate disturbance have the potential to hugely, hugely magnify and multiply the permanent impairment rating provided for under the strict application of the AMA guides. But again, if you're gonna employ alternative impairment ratings, the opinion has to qualify as substantial medical evidence. So before we get into today's discussion of gate derangement cases, let's just review what it takes in order, in order to qualify your opinion as substantial medical evidence. Number one, you must provide a strict rating under the scheduled AMA guides chapter, table, chart, or method <clears throat> that relates to the particular body part that you're evaluating. That's usually not too difficult of a step to do. No qualified medical evaluators have any difficulty with step one, which is providing a strict permanent impairment rating. Step number two is a little bit more difficult, and this is where qualified medical evaluators can struggle. With step number two, you are required to explain why the strict rating under the AMA guides is not an accurate rating in the particular case that you're evaluating. So this may prove to be a bit difficult. And if you're gonna try and prove that the scheduled rating under the AMA guides is not accurate, you must have multiple voluminous and compelling reasons. So imagine how this looks in uh, the body of your report. You provide a strict rating under the AMA guides, Underneath that, you would say something similar to the following. You would say, in my opinion, the above rating of 10% whole person impairment under the strict rating, uh, under a strict application of the AMA guides is not the most accurate description of Mrs. Jones impairment, period. Reasons for this conclusion include colon, and then you drop down to a new line, and then you must have bullet point after bullet point after bullet point, after bullet point of compelling and voluminous reasons to explain why the strict rating is not accurate. Now, if you're able to do that <laughs> and you're convinced that your reasons are compelling, then your obligation is step number three is to provide an alternative impairment rating under uh, or within the four corners of the AMA guides. And here you have great latitude and great liberty to explore different chapters, different charts, different methods, uh, different figures within the uh, four corners of the AMA guides. And you can come up with almost any conceivable alternative impairment rating within the four corners of the AMA guides. But <laughs> then comes the difficult part with step four you must explain to the parties why, why, why the alternative impairment rating is the most accurate rating. And that would look in the body of your report something similar to the following. In my opinion, Mrs. Jones is accurately described by blank, fill in your alternative impairment rating, referencing the chart, table, or chapter, or method within the four corners of the AMA guides. And then you would say, reasons for this conclusion, the conclusion is that this is the most accurate rating, include colon, new line, drop down, and then bullet point, after bullet point, after bullet point, after bullet point, multiple voluminous and compelling bullet points to explain why this new alternative impairment rating trumps and is more accurate than the strict rating. Now, after you've done these four steps within the body of your report, I want you to look at steps numbers two and steps number three and ask yourself if those reasons that you provide qualify as substantial medical evidence. In other words, are they based on an adequate history and an adequate examination? 
Are they based on relevant facts? Are they based on uh, facts that are no longer, they're not based on facts no longer germane? Is there any speculation, surmise, conjecture, or guess within uh, the, the sentences of your reasons? If you're convinced that your explanations under step number two and step number four are compelling and are based on relevant facts and that you're prepared to stand behind those in deposition, then go ahead and submit it. Because if your opinion survives this four-step procedure, there's a very good chance that your opinion is the most accurate rating. <laughs> you see, these four, this four-step procedure serves as a series of filters through which opinions, permanent impairment opinions, must pass. If the opinion cannot pass through the filter, if it gets stuck in the filter, it's because it's not true. It's not an accurate permanent impairment rating that's not based on relevant facts. Only true and accurate permanent impairment ratings will pass through the filters, okay? So this is a procedure that you go through every single time that you provide an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman. Now, in today's discussion, uh, we're gonna see how some qualified medical evaluators succeeded. I have three cases that I wanna share with you where qualified medical evaluators provided for analogies to gait disturbance as their alternative impairment rating and thereby significantly increased the permanent impairment rating and the opinion was upheld as substantial medical evidence. So I have three home run cases to share with you. And then I wanna share with you uh, one strikeout case where qualified medical evaluator tried, he tried to produce a better result, but <laughs> he had no reason to support his effort. And it was simply clear to the parties and he even stated himself for various reasons that he was simply trying to achieve a better result and this opinion uh, was not upheld. Okay, so let's begin today's discussion. Uh, permanent impairments or alternate permanent impairments by analogy to gait derangement and gait disturbance. And let's begin with a discussion of the classic case uh, that exemplifies many of these Almarez Guzman principles. Classic case, Cannon versus the city of Sacramento. Okay, so let's begin. This is the Cannon versus City of Sacramento case. And this case, uh, as we'll see, involved a police officer who spent some time on his feet and uh, filed a claim for industrial injury for plantar fasciitis. And when he was declared to be permanent and stationary, the qualified medical evaluator uh, diagnosed plantar fasciitis. And at this point in time, Mr. Cannon was basically mostly asymptomatic with just a few exceptions. So let's see how the qualified medical evaluator handled a case that's not described in the AMA guides for which the examinee was mostly resolved with only trace remaining or residual subjective complaints. So what happened was the uh, qualified medical evaluator provided for a permanent impairment rating that was not contained within the AMA guides. So under the strict application of the AMA guides, the examinee qualified for 0% whole person impairment. And the qualified medical evaluator uh, provided for 7% whole person impairment by using an analogy to gait disturbance. So of course, uh, the employer, the payer of these benefits, meaning the claims administrator, appealed the decision. And let's read uh, how this played out. The Court of Appeal affirmed the Appeals Board opinion and decision, which held that rating of impairment, rating of impairment by analogy to a different condition is permissible. Even when no objective abnormalities are found, and the rating is based solely on subjective complaints of pain and that rating by analogy is not limited to complex or extraordinary cases. 
when the Court of Appeal found that applicant injured his left foot while working as a police officer for the city of Sacramento. The agreed medical evaluator reported that it was acceptable to characterize the applicant's residual condition using a gait derangement abnormality. By analogy, using Almarez Guzman II as a basis, that the agreed medical evaluator noted that heel pain, or for that matter, other aspects of pain that do not have any accompanying objective measurement or abnormalities, do not rate anything in the AMA guides, whether or not these problems interferes with one's activities. That the applicant's heel pain interferes with weight-bearing activities, particularly running. And that, he, and that the, quali uh, the agreed medical evaluator thought that by analogy, it would be similar to an individual with a limp and arthritis, resulting in the 7% impairment recommended by the agreed medical evaluator. The Court of Appeal uh, held that Labor Code 4660B1 does not mandate that impairment for any particular condition be assessed in any particular way under the AMA guides, and that statute provides merely that the nature of the physical injury or disfigurement shall incorporate, shall incorporate the descriptions and measurements of physical impairments and the corresponding percentages of impairments. So this is a fascinating case where the police officer at the time of the permanent impairment evaluation was mostly resolved of his plantar fasciitis. His only subjective complaint was that he had some limitations with running. Walking apparently was fine, standing was apparently fine, but the Greed Medical Evaluator analogized running to what was referred to as weight-bearing activities, and he analogized uh, the plantar fasciitis to other conditions that interfere with weight-bearing activities, and he analogized to permanent impairment due to a gait disturbance. So let's explore this a little bit more. So the employer appealed the decision from the WCAB, which determined that the respondent was entitled to a permanent disability rating based on the agreed medical examiner's finding of permanent impairment by analogy to gait disturbance of 7% whole person impairment for an examinee who had only minimal, minimal subjective complaints and had no objective findings whatsoever. Now, I wonder if you've ever had plantar fasciitis. I myself have had plantar fasciitis probably four or five times in each foot, <laughs> four or five times in each foot. And plantar fasciitis, you know, it's one of those conditions that mm, with treatment and time, uh, it gets better and it resolves. And then the cycle repeats a few years later and you're seemingly in and out of plantar fasciitis all the time. Well, this examinee received a permanent impairment rating of 7% whole person. This translates into thousands of dollars of benefits for a condition uh, that had no objective findings and only minimal, minimal subjective complaints. That was complaints of pain with running. Now, the complaint of, is not of limitations with running. The complaint is of pain with running. So the examiner can, the examinee can still run, but he subjectively described pain with running. Well, by overview of the case, and let's get to the conclusion, the claimant injured his left foot and heel while working. He was diagnosed with plantar fasciitis and he received treatment. After his condition became PNS, no objective abnormalities were identifiable, but he continued to experience pain. In other words, he continued to report that he had pain in his left heel that affected weight-bearing activities. An agreed medical examiner, examiner determined that the claimant's condition was equivalent to a limp with arthritis, which resulted in a 7% whole person impairment for purposes of determining permanent disability. So here's what's interesting. The agreed medical examiner determined that the condition was equivalent 
to a limp with arthritis when the examinee had no limp and x-rays demonstrated no arthritis. But the point here is that a limp with arthritis affects weight-bearing activities. And the agreed medical evalu evaluator analogized that plantar fasciitis, like a limp with arthritis, affects weight-bearing activities. So this may seem to be a remote and somewhat tangential <laughs> analogy, but believe it or not, it was upheld by the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. The court held that it was not improper to rate a claimant's condition by analogy where there were no objective findings and the rating was based solely upon a subjective experience of pain. And we should emphasize that it was more of a subjective complaint of pain because the agreed medical evaluator did not observe the examinee to run and could not confirm the presence of pain with running. Such a rating complied with the requirements of Labor Code 4660B1 to incorporate the AMA guides into the description of whole person impairment of a scheduled permanent disability rating. However, the AMA guides do not rate conditions with only subjective symptoms instead calling for the physician's exercise of clinical judgment to assess the impairment most accurately. And the outcome was that the court affirmed the board's opinion and decision after reconsideration and upheld the permanent impairment rating of 7% whole person by analogy to gait disturbance. So this was a classic case that uh, illustrates the principle that in many cases there are conditions that are not rated within the AMA guides, particularly conditions that have no objective abnormalities but are characterized only by subjective complaints. In those cases, we can analogize to other conditions that create similar, same or similar functional limitations. And in this case, the agreed medical evaluator argued for limitations with weight bearing activities similar to the types of limitations that would be experienced by a person who had a limp with arthritis. So uh, this qualifies in my opinion as a permanent impairment home run because it had the effect of increasing the permanent impairment rating from 0%, 0% to as high as 7% for otherwise minimal subjective complaints. Okay, so that uh, represents a, a home run case by analogy to gait disturbance. Let's talk now about uh, Mejia Sanchez versus Savers Stores. Okay, this is Mejia Sanchez versus Savers Stores. And uh, Miss Mejia Sanchez uh, suffered an injury to her left knee. This resulted in the need for uh, a medial meniscectomy surgery, uh, I should say a partial medial meniscectomy surgery, which under the strict application of the AMA guides qualifies only for 1%, 1% whole person impairment. 1%, can you believe that? In the infinite wisdom of the authors of the AMA guides, they don't ascribe much impairment, much loss of function or loss of use of the lower extremity following a partial meniscectomy procedure. Well, the 1% whole person impairment rating ballooned, ballooned to 24% whole person impairment by the use of several analogies that describe the loss of function of the lower extremity following the meniscectomy procedure. And lo and behold, this was upheld uh, by the appeals board and this represents a at least an eight time an octupling that is an octupling of the permanent impairment rating to possibly as high as 24 times the permanent impairment rating from 1% to 24% so let's follow the uh, medical evaluators logic through this case Okay, so the qualified medical evaluator in this case was Dr. Chen, 
Dr. Chen evaluated the applicant on three occasions. He reviewed medical reports and records. He provided uh, five reports. And he diagnosed the applicant with left knee sprain and left knee meniscus tear. She had undergone a left knee arthroscopy in 2012. And she had a second surgery a little bit later, three months later in April 2012. So in his report, he describes her subjective uh, symptoms. He says the left knee pain has improved since the surgeries. She's able to walk and stand 20 minutes at a time. She's able to climb stairs, but with pain. She needs to use the, the handrails. She wears a brace at home and outside. She lives on the fourth floor. She uses the elevator. She wakens three times a week due to her knee pain. She continues to have weakness and pain give way of the left knee. She has persistent pain in the knee. Kneeling and squatting makes the pain worse. Now, notice these subjective complaints. They're entirely subjective. Dr. Chen cannot corroborate that she needs to use the handrails. This is simply based on her testimony. He cannot corroborate that she wears a brace at home and outside. He cannot corroborate that um, she's having pain give way of the knee. He does not say that she cannot kneel and she cannot squat, only that those activities make the knee pain worse. So this sounds like relatively benign subjective complaints and relatively benign, if any, limitations and activities of daily living, which possibly could qualify for exactly what the AMA's guides describe, which is 1% whole person impairment rating. But Dr. Chen uh, had a different idea. So Dr. Chen uh, attempts to follow the four-step procedure, and uh, he provides uh, a permanent impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides. He provides an alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman, and he explains uh, both. So let's review his uh, rationale. According to the AMA guides, for a partial medial, medial meniscectomy, there is 1% whole person impairment. There is no rating for loss of range of motion as she has full range of motion. And in addition, Ms. Sanchez's condition is described in section 18.3, which has excess pain in the context of a verifiable medical condition. So in addition to the 1% whole person impairment, he opines that she qualifies for an additional whole person impairment rating simply as a pain rating. So in, under the strict application of the guides, he provides an opinion for 3% whole person impairment. But he says uh, recently there's been some changes in the law and we now have Almarez and Guzman too. And the physician may provide an alternate rating in order to uh, more accurately describe the permanent impairment. And he states that rating by the strict AMA guides does not consider the loss of function, in particular, the loss of lifting capacity due to Ms. Sanchez Mejia's knee injury. So this is his reasoning as to why the strict application of the AMA guides is not accurate because the permanent impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides does not consider the loss of function, in particular the loss of lifting capacity, due to the left knee medial meniscectomy. Okay? So for that reason, uh, the doctor thinks uh, uh, to himself, how can he more accurately describe the permanent impairment? Well, he opines that in his opinion, she's lost at least 50% of her lifting capacity due to pain and weakness in the knee. So this would particularly relate to, say, lifting from the floor. So he analogizes to hernia out of chapter six of the AMA guides. He says, by analogy, according to table six nine, Ms. Sanchez Mejia's condition is best described by class two herniation, herniation such as an inguinal hernia. 
which describes frequent discomfort, precluding heavy lifting, but not hampering some activities of daily living. As a result, she's given 15% whole person impairment, and he explains his reasoning. He says, I use this table as it relates to lifting, which is Ms. Mejia's major concern as a result of her knee injury. So he goes from 1% to 15% by analogy to uh, class 2 herniation, which reflects a loss of capacity for lifting. And then in addition, he provides an alternative impairment rating due to gait derangement. And he says for the gait, I've considered other tables, including table 13-15, which is out of the nervous system chapter. This table addresses gait. Ms. Sanchez Mejia would be described by class one as she walks some distance with difficulty and without assistance, but she is not limited to level surfaces. <clears throat> now in the description it says, walks some distance with difficulty and without assistance, but is limited to level surfaces. So here, here she says that she, she is described partially by the class one in that she walks some distance with difficulty and without assistance, but this particular examinee is not limited to level surfaces. So therefore he gives her 7% whole person impairment and he supports his opinion for 7% by comparing this gait derangement in table 13-15 uh, with gait derangement in table 17-5, which describes an individual with an antalgic limp, but a negative Trendelenburg test, which is a mild gait derangement, also qualifying as 7%. So he sort of does a cross-referencing of his own impairment rating to assess the accuracy of his own impairment rating. So in addition to the 15% due to loss of lifting capacity, he provides an additional 7%. Now we're up to 21 to 22% whole person for an examinee who under the strict application of the AMA guides would qualify for at most 1% whole person impairment. And he cites a uh, precedent setting case uh, wherein the qualified medical evaluator arrove at a similar conclusion. So he supports uh, his opinion with uh, a precedent similar, precedent setting similar case. And he says uh, in the case of uh, Jack's London Seafood, the qualified medical evaluator concluded that since the applicant had lost half of her lifting capacity and had difficulties with ambulation, she would be rated under both the gait derangement table and table 6-9 by analogy. This whole person impairment, based on both of these analogies, was accepted by the trial judge and an award issued. The Court of Appeals found that this was the most accurate way to describe the functional losses. So he cites uh, another case, another similar case, wherein the applicant was rated similarly. And this turned out to be uh, an excellent strategy because the courts stated in their final decision, they stated, in light of the court's decision in the other Fitzsimmons case, this is the Jack's London Seafood versus Fitzsimmons, I would agree that in this particular case, the most accurate way to describe Ms. Mejia Sanchez's impairment is to use both the whole person impairment based on lifting and the whole person impairment based on gait. Combining these two impairments under the combined values chart would generate a whole person impairment of 21%. This is the most accurate way to address the functional loss. I believe that as compared to rating under the strict application of the AMA guides, the rating under Almarez Guzman best describes her condition as that rating considers the loss of lifting capacity. The pain is not included when considering the Almarez Guzman rating. Adding the pain impairment would be redundant. Okay, so the final whole person impairment in this case was 21% compared to the 1% which was 
provided for under the strict application of the AMA guides. So this is a massive, massive increase in the permanent impairment rating simply by using alternative impairment ratings within the four corners of the guides. And uh, it would seem that uh, the doctor did a good job in explaining why the uh, impairment rating under the strict application of the AMA guides was not accurate and why the alternative impairment rating uh, was more accurate. So it would seem, I say, let's see what the judge in this particular case had to say. So of course you know the defendant appealed the decision and it came to the appeals board and the final decision of the appeals board uh, is the following. They stated that in the instant case, Dr. Chen evaluated applicant three times and reviewed numerous medical records and reports and a statement and deposition transcript of the applicant. So here they're setting up the tone or the stage to qualify the doctor's opinion as substantial medical evidence in that Dr. Chen was well aware uh, of the history and he adequately examined the applicant uh, not once, not twice, but on three successive times. After providing impairment factors under the strict guides, Dr. Chen analogized to Table 6-9 and Tables 13-15 that provided a more accurate reflection of the applicant's impairment still within the four corners of the AMA guides. I find Dr. Chen's opinions as to permanent disability and as to apportionment to constitute substantial medical evidence. Dr. Chen's opinions on permanent disability are based on a thorough medical examination, a review of the medical records and reports, and an accurate history of the injury. It reflects the facts and reasonings for his opinions and are predicated on reasonable medical probability. Based upon my review of the evidence at trial, I find the opinions of Dr. Chen justify the permanent impairment disability rating instructions as to the impairment caused by applicant's injury to her knee. So here, the judge claims and states that in her opinion, Dr. Chen adequately dotted all his I's, crossed all his T's, and hit all the high notes in the four-step procedure to qualify his uh, opinion as substantial medical evidence. And we can all learn a lot from how he handled this particular case because his opinion and conclusion in this case uh, made a significant difference in the life of the examinee. Okay, now finally for our last home run case, we're going to talk about the Trujillo versus Colton Unified School District case. Okay, so with the Trujillo case, the examinee suffered uh, an injury to the right ankle, which under the strict application of the AMA guides really did not present with any objective abnormalities, qualified for 0% whole person impairment. Well, the medical evaluator increased the impairment rating to 35% by analogy to gait disturbance under chapter 13, which is interesting, he chose not to use uh, chapter 17, but rather uh, deferred instead to chapter 13. And the workers' compensation judge denied the alternative impairment rating. The workers' compensation judge was not convinced that the alternative impairment rating qualified as substantial medical evidence. And of course, the applicant attorney appealed the decision it went to the appeals board and lo and behold, the appeals board was convinced, was convinced that the opinion uh, was substantial and they upheld the alternative impairment rating for 35% whole person. Okay, so in describing the permanent impairment, the uh, medical evaluator, who was Dr. Jackson in this case, he said in his report, he said, chapter 17 was referenced regarding the lower extremity problems. The primary method for determining the permanent impairment in the lower extremities is the loss of range of motion 
as well as some other secondary methods, but in this case there are no good categories for the assignment of permanent impairment to the right ankle, especially in view of Ms. Trujillo's difficulty with ambulation. So he instead chose to assign the permanent impairment for the right ankle based upon a gait disturbance. However, using chapter 17 and table 17-5, Ms. Trujillo really would not fit into any of these categories because she is not truly wheelchair bound and any of the other categories under the severe ratings require the use of braces or crutches which are not necessary and even under the moderate category crutches as well as canes plus braces are usually required while under the mild category this would not seem to be an adequate reflection of her permanent impairment and we're going to look at these categories here in just a moment therefore this examiner will utilize table 1315 under class 3 because Ms. Trujillo obviously has difficulty arising and maintaining a standing position and although she can walk a very short distance without assistance she does not appear to be safe which would mean from this examiner's perspective that she should be utilizing a support device taking all of these criteria into consideration this examiner would assign 35 percent whole person impairment which is between the minimum of 20% whole person impairment and the maximum of 39% whole person impairment as Ms. Trujillo certainly seems to have a great deal of difficulty with ambulation which would put her towards the upper end of the scale. So in your opinion, uh, does it seem through the use of language that this examiner is trying to achieve a better result by using an alternative impairment rating. It, it certainly seems that way, especially taking into consideration that he provides for 39%, uh, I'm sorry, 35% whole person impairment, which is pretty darn close to the 39% maximum found within this range. And uh, assigning 35% whole person impairment when the range is from 20 to 39 is more than 50% of the way through the range for an examinee who otherwise qualifies for 0% under the strict application of the AMA guide 0% whole person impairment rating here we have a much 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 better result at 35% whole person impairment and this is according to class 3 under table 1315 so here's table 1315 and uh, I want to emphasize that table 1315 is taken out of chapter 13 which is the nervous system chapter and uh, there is a table in chapter 17 which is table 17-5 which describes gait derangements due to lower extremity disorders in chapter 13 these station and gait disorders are supposedly due to some sort of nervous system disorder, some sort of neurologic deficit, some sort of neurologic injury. So in invoking table 1315 in his impairment rating, Dr. Jackson uh, analogizes the examinee's gait to a person who has a neurologic disorder which causes derangement of gait due to the neuro neurologic disorder. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Trujillo does not have a neurologic disorder. She has an orthopedic lower extremity ankle disorder. But here he analogizes to gait due to neurologic disorder. So let's read these different uh, gait derangements. Class 1, this is an examinee who can rise to a standing position. They can walk, but they have difficulty with elevations, grades, stairs, deep chairs, and long distances. So I want you to picture in your mind an examinee who has difficulty with stairs, an examinee who has difficulty with deep chairs, an examinee who has difficulty with elevations. This is a person who mm, is having some difficulty with ambulation. Well, class two, this is a person who's uh, in a bit worse shape. This person can rise to a standing position 
can walk some uh, distance with difficulty and without assistance, but is limited to level surfaces. This is an examinee who cannot do stairs, who cannot do elevations, uh, is strictly limited to level surfaces. So I want you to picture this type of an examinee. This is an examinee who has to take the elevator everywhere they go. This is an examinee who cannot walk long distances. They can only walk what is described as some distance, which is a limited distance. Well, Dr. Jackson chose to employ the class three station and gait disorder. This describes a person who can rise and maintain a standing position with difficulty. So I want you to picture that in your mind. Rises and maintains standing position with difficulty. So this is a person who's very weak, has no balance, and can barely, barely stand without assistance, and certainly cannot walk without assistance. Now, Ms. Trujillo could walk without assistance, but he felt that for walking she was not safe, that her lower extremity could uh, give way on her and that she could fall, and that in his opinion, this uh, was analogous to her requiring an assistive device or that she should require an assistive device. So for that reason, he went all the way up this table to the class three and elected for 35% whole person impairment for an examinee who otherwise qualified for very little or zero under the AMA guides. So, of course, the defendant objected to this determination and appealed the rating. And on appeal, the judge upheld the rating. And here is uh, the appeals board's decision. They state that the standard methods for rating lower extremity impairment uh, are listed in Chapter 17 of the guides. Chapter 17 sets forth 13 methods to assess lower extremity impairment. At his deposition, Dr. Jackson was asked about these different methods and he explained why they did not apply to the applicant's condition and why they did not accurately reflect the applicant's impairment. He stated that because the applicant had a history of pain, had extensive ankle surgery, and had mobility issues because of her right ankle injury, that these, uh, the strict application or any of the 13 methods did not apply. He stated that she came to her appointment in a wheelchair and he found her subjective complaints to be credible. Finding all of the methods of assessment in Chapter 17 wanting, Dr. Jackson explained that the most accurate reflection of applicants' disability was found in Chapter 13, which generally deals with nervous system disorders. Since applicant had trouble with ambulation due to her right ankle orthopedic injury, Dr. Jackson likened the impairment to the mobility problems suffered by those with nervous system or neurologic impairments and use table 1315 to rate the applicant's permanent impairment. The judge concluded in this case, Dr. Jackson adequately explained why a departure from the standard methods of assessment was required by the unique facts of this case and explained why another chapter within the guides provided a more accurate reflection of the applicant's disability. So doctor, excuse me, so doctors, you can see that as long as you can explain the high and wow, uh, I'm sorry, the how and why of your alternative impairment rating, almost any rating, as long as it qualifies uh, as substantial medical evidence, will be upheld by the trier of fact, whether that be the workers' compensation judge or the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. Okay, so those were three home run cases where the permanent impairment rating was greatly, greatly increased. Uh, in some cases, increased from 0% up into the 20 and even 30% whole person impairment. So when the alternative impairment rating is an accurate rating, it makes a great difference uh, to the examinee. So uh, if you have an examinee whose impairment can be more accurately related 
under an alternative impairment rating and you can substantiate that opinion with substantial medical evidence, then by all means, go ahead and provide the examinee uh, the higher alternative impairment rating. Well, in our last case today, we have uh, a strikeout case, the Kramer versus County of Sonoma case, where the qualified medical evaluator was not able to provide an opinion that qualified as substantial medical evidence, and the alternative impairment rating uh, was therefore not upheld. So with the Kramer case, the AME opined for a 10% whole person impairment under the strict application of the AMA guides. And then he provided an alternative impairment rating in order to obtain a better result. And he even uh, uses that language within the body of his report. Well, the workers' compensation judge found the alternative impairment rating uh, and upheld the alternative impairment rating, but the defendant appealed that stating that the opinion did not qualify as substantial medical evidence and it was the appeals board that found the alternative rating to not qualify as substantial medical evidence. So let's look at some of the details of this case. Okay, so here's the facts. Applicant sustained an injury to her left ankle as a result of a slip and fall uh, in 2011. She was evaluated by the AME who provided an opinion on permanent impairment as follows. He says, it's my opinion using the AMA guides that she would best be rated using gait impairment, noting that she uses a walker, which is equivalent to using two canes or two crutches. Therefore, she would be offered a 40% whole person impairment out of table 17-5. So he provides that as his primary impairment rating. Then he says, in the alternative, she could be rated re referencing table 1726 with ankle impairment due to ankylosis in a valgus position with a 10% whole person impairment since the valgus positioning is approximately 150 degrees. So here he provides seemingly what is an alternative impairment rating here due to ankylosis. Well, as we're going to see, gait impairments are secondary to the other impairments in chapter 17 and actually the ankylosis impairment should have been the primary impairment so the primary impairment should have been for 10 percent whole person impairment and the alternative impairment for 40 percent whole person impairment but this doctor did them in reverse he states that this examiner meaning himself he would favor using the gait derangement rating, noting that the patient has an attempted pantalar arthrodesis, probably a failed arthrodesis. This would render or this would result in a significant gait abnormality that is not accounted for entirely by a simple ankylosis measurement. Now is that true? Does an ankylosis measurement not account for gait abnormality? If a person has an ankle ankylosis with valgus positioning at 150 degrees do you think that's going to affect their ambulation it, of course it will of course it will and that's why 10 percent is higher than some of the other mild gait disturbances described in tap, uh, table 17-5 so this reasoning that gait disturbance is not accounted for by the ankylosis measurement is suspect at most and is a weak is a weak argument at best so the defense attorney wrote to uh, dr miles and asked for a supplemental report and the defense attorney pointed out several uh discrepancies in the agreed medical evaluators uh, permanent impairment opinion and the agreed medical evaluator replied by a supplemental report by stating that i have received the defense attorney's report uh, the defense attorney noted that I referred to a gait derangement as a method of rating disability. I offered a 40% rating referring to table 17-5. He noted that this level of disability exceeds that provided for an amputation of the lower leg. I believe amputation of the lower leg uh, is like 35%. Amputation of the entire leg, meaning a hip disarticulation qualifies for 40%. 
So here the amputation is referencing only the lower leg, which is less than 40%, and here the AME opined for a 40% rating. Okay. So he admits that the defense attorney is correct that before I resort to the gait derangement table, I should, whenever possible, use a different rating. Gait derangement should only be used when a more specific method is not possible. He says, obviously, I can appropriately, appropriately rate Ms. Kramer referencing arthrodesis with valgus deformity. This would qualify for 10% whole person impairment. And here he sinks his boat. He says, I used the gait derangement impairment primarily because I felt she deserved a higher rating. <laughs> so here the doctor shows his cards and admits that he's simply trying to achieve a better result for the examinee. However, he's not able to explain why the higher result is the more accurate rating than is the strict rating, which contains within it a component of gait derangement. In other words, an ankylosis impairment considers the functional loss caused by the ankylosis. He says, obviously, the defense attorney is correct in that part of her gait derangement is a consequence of her obesity and her peripheral neuropathy. Therefore, I agree with him that it may be appropriate, may be appropriate to consider rating her using the more specific rating of a valgus arthrodesis as referred to in uh, table 1726 for 10% whole person impairment. And we'll see what the judge had to say about that, but let's just finish up with his argument. He says, uh, yet when one steps back and looks at the overall level of her current disability as a consequence of her injury, the level of disability of 10% is fairly low. And I, my question to the evaluator is it's fairly low compared to what? Compared to what? It describes the exact deformity that she has, which is 10 degrees of ankylosis deformity. It contains within it consideration for the functional loss. What is the level of disability fairly low compared to? And therefore, he says, I will leave it up to the trier of fact to decide whether or not the Almarez Guzman decision may apply to my rating or not. However, he says, I must agree with Mr. Miller that his analysis in Ms. Kramer's case is quite cogent, and I do, do, do agree that to an extent, her overall disability is a consequence of her non industrial diabetic neuropathy and obesity plus her arthrodesis. So here, Qualified medical evaluator provides an alternative impairment rating. He provides a strict rating. He gives no justification as to which of the two is the more accurate rating, and he does not provide a final opinion as to which impairment rating he considers to be the most accurate rating, leaving that up to the trier of fact. Well, the judge uh, opined and reported on this matter. He says that the doctor's opinion as to the applicant's level of permanent disability does not constitute substantial medical evidence. Although he did provide a strict rating for the applicant's injury, he did not explain whether the applicant's strict rating was accurate, meaning whether it adequately reflects her level of disability. Then, okay, so that's step two. Remember we said that step two could provide some degree of difficulty. Then on step three, the judge says, although Dr. Miles provided an alternative rating using the four corners of the AMA guides, he failed on step four, which is he, did, he failed to explain why the alternative rating most accurately reflects the applicant's level of disability. And in fact, he left that determination to the trier of fact when it's actually his and his determination only. And the judge quoted a specific case law, said that it is the physician's role, it is the physician's role to assess whole person impairment by a report that sets forth facts and reasoning to support its conclusions. And here, Dr. Miles improperly delegated that role to the workers' compensation appeals judge, 
And for these reasons, Dr. Miles' opinion is not substantial medical evidence. So the alternative impairment rating for 40% whole person uh, was not upheld. And the strict rating, 10%, due to the application, uh, due to the ankylosis impairment, was found to be uh, the more accurate rating. So doctors, those are some fascinating cases. Do you agree? We have three cases where the medical evaluator was able to analogize to other charts, tables, and even chapters within the AMA guides to provide for substantially higher permanent impairment ratings for the examinee. Now, because those evaluators were able to substantiate their opinions with substantial medical evidence, it indicates that those opinions have a high probability of being correct, of being actually true. See, you're not going to be able to provide for alternative impairment ratings that double, triple, quadruple, etc., the permanent impairment rating, if it's not true. The alternative impairment rating has to pass through the truth filters, and if it successfully passes through the four filters, it's only because it's true for the particular examinee. It's only because the alternative impairment rating fits the facts of the case, fits the history, is consistent with the physical examination, is consistent with the activities, uh, the examinee's limitations with activities of daily living. Only alternative impairment ratings that are true will be upheld by the trier of fact. And if you simply try and achieve a better result by employing analogy to gait, gait disturbance, or any other analogy, it'll simply be exposed that you're trying to achieve a better result and the opinion will not be upheld. So in our next session, I wanna to talk to you about another uh, important topic that's uh, uh, popular press right now and is a current, uh, current issue that's facing all qualified medical evaluators. And that has to do with combining versus adding permanent impairment ratings. Now, according to the AMA guides, when we have multiple permanent impairments, whether that be multiple impairments of a single body part or impairments of multiple body parts, the AMA guides advise us to combine those impairments through the use of the combined values chart. And there's recent rumbling about adding those impairments versus combining the impairments because it seems that combining the impairments has a compressive effect on the final impairment rating whereas adding the impairments has only an additive uh, effect on the final impairment rating and there's some evidence that's showing that impairments uh, can have a synergistic or additive additive effect to each other and therefore therefore the impairment rating should not be combined but rather should be additive so I look forward to exploring that topic with you in great detail at our very next session. And for now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.